Hello and welcome to the Hoosier Football Tailgate here on the Believe Network and sponsored by Bet Online. Today we're going to do a little bit of uh, looking back a little bit at Rutgers game with Dylan Sin from the Journal Gazette. Get his in, uh, input and take on the Hoosiers at this point in the year, as well as a look at the Penn State Nittany Lions a little bit later. Um, the game is at Penn State, Happy Valley, on Saturday afternoon at noon on CBS. CBS will have the coverage of the Penn State versus Indiana. And right now, we'd like to welcome the one and only Dylan Sin to the Hoosier Football Tailgate. Dylan, I'm going to put us on here together. Let's see if I can do that correctly. There he is. I got to get you sized right here, my man. No but, problem. Uh, but, uh, oh, there we go. Um, how you been, my man? I've been good. I've been good. You know, it's, uh, it's a busy time. Football is going on. Basketball is starting. <laughs> the life of a sports journalist. That's right. That's great. Yeah, I know. It's getting to that time of year with, uh, all sports, but let's talk about these Indiana Hoosiers right now. And, you know, I guess the first question I got for you is not, not a big, big deal, but it looks and appears that Tom Allen is going to continue with Sorsby as the quarterback. Not that he did anything Saturday that would say that he needs to reevaluate that, but Talk about Sor what you thought about Sors Sorsby's play Saturday against Rutgers. Yeah. I mean, so I, I've said this for, for most of the season. I, I think that Indiana has two players who could be eventually very good quarterbacks. I think Sorsby does some things that you like as a quarterback. I think um he can, he has a good arm. He's accurate on short to intermediate throws. Um he is a strong runner. I've better a better runner than Taven. Uh, and, and he moved pretty well. The problem is, I don't. I think he's still developing, right? Um, th there's there were times where he bailed out of the pocket way too fast. There were times where he just missed some throws. I mean, he only completed less than fifty percent of his passes. And I know that Rutgers is a good defense, and there's going to be some growing pains. There it was the first time he played a full collegiate game ever, right? Mm -hmm. um, but. I, I don't think it's ideal that he's starting this season. Although, to be fair, I don't think it's ideal that Taven Jackson was starting this season either. <laughs> I think both of them, it would have been good for them to have a year to sit and learn the offense and just kind of get better at the quarterback things that you need to get better at. But I do think that they're talented. Um, and I, I think that maybe playing them now will set them up to be better next year. So I I, right. I think that, that that's – there's a, a – upside and a downside to it i think but we we did we did see some very positive things from brendan sorsby on Saturday. you know th th that's an, th another point that you know i've heard in the conversations and i can you know i can get uh a feel for some of the questions being asked of either rod carey or tom allen sometimes it appears that people want sorsby or jackson to play like they're a three-year starter yeah. And we forget that they're both redshirt freshmen with limited Big Ten play. Yeah. And they are not going to play like they're juniors and seniors. Right. And that is one big thing that's plagued um, I use offense to a degree is that we forget they're redshirt freshmen. Now they're talented kids, but by their, you know, they're by no means are they the uh, the Allen kid from Penn state, who's having a phenomenal uh, career, but you got to look what what's around them. That's the key thing. What Brendan Sorsby or Taven Jackson has around them is limited. And I think that gets lost in the picture of offense thoughts on that. Yeah. And so I, I think that it doesn't help that they have some running back injuries right now, right? I think Josh mm. Henderson being out has hurt. He was their best blocking running back and a very good running back in his own right. I do think that Indiana's skill core is better than I think people give it credit for. I do think that Cam Camper is a star at receiver. I think he is a very, very good receiver who will play on Sundays. Um, EJ Williams getting hurt, the kid from Clemson they got as a transfer. I think that, that has hurt them. I think he showed some things early right. in the season that suggested he could be a very good receiver. 
Um, I, I, I think that it, it helped that they got Trent Howland going. Uh, against Rutgers on Saturdays. They have some pieces, and I do think the offensive line is better than it was last year. I don't think it's good. I think it's much better than it was mm-hmm. last year. I think Bob Bostad deserves credit for that. So I think the skill core is better than people give it credit for. I, I still think it's probably not good enough to make these guys to carry these guys along, right? It needs to be right. something where you have a you have a decent skill core. You probably need a decent quarterback to make that work. And neither of those guys is quite at that level right now I think they're probably average to below average right now I'm not saying they can't get better and I'm sure they will they both have as you said some talent um, but I do think that it's one of those things where if you have a decent skill core you need a decent quarterback Indiana doesn't have that right now right and and that's the one thing that I would say is that <clears throat> due to the fact that they're lo- they've lost some talented people around them you know I just you know having one guy you know I don't think I don't think they've done a very good job of targeting certain receivers in the passing game to help the quarterback. Now that may be because of now the transition, um, you know, with a rod carry really hesitant on some of these things, understanding that he's got two young quarterbacks. I think that's played a real big part in the mindset of the offensive coordinators at Indiana, be it Walt Bell or now rod carry is they're overly protective of the quarterbacks or have been with justification, but now it's almost become a handcuff and they got to do some things in the passing game. I think to open that up if, you know, because they're just not getting the targets to the, where they want to be down, you know, on the offense and a downfield threat. And it's just one of those things that has just turned into now this, uh, (laughs) you know, inconsistency on an offensive play in that regard looking back at this game at Rutgers here, here's my thought too and see if you you kind of have the same feeling with it um, that ball game came down to three plays I mean when you really look at it you know through the lens of breaking it down and looking at it black and white um, statistical differences minimum other than the time of possession yeah that was very lopsided. And the three plays that I'm talking about was the block punt for the touchdown, yep. the muff punt that led to three points right before half, very, a very big momentum change. Very few people talk about. Yeah. And then the opening drive of the third quarter where, where Rutgers went right down the field on a 70, 75 play drive, took up six minutes of a, of a play clock. And that catapult the, them up to uh 24 to 14 at that time i believe those three plays of the game had much more to say about anything offense defense because they had no uh on two of them they had no say so in as far as offense and defense went and that's one thing that i forgot i mean nobody to me talked about that enough and went right to the negatives that we always do is we're not doing this on offense. We're not doing that on defense. It was a 17-14 game at halftime, and you would have thought any year I was down by 50. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that as it pertains to the game in itself as, you know, the outtake on all the, you know, the negative vibes around it and all? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. I think to, to, to talk about what you said about the statistics, Rutgers gained 4.7 yards per play. Indiana gained 4.6 yards per play. It was about as even as, as you could get. They right. just gave they gave 10 points away. They did. They they 10 points, they just said here have it. And all of them in the first half. And right. so you so you can say like they, they could have very easily been up at halftime. Yeah. And then, and then you're the talk, worst. Exactly. And then you're talking about an entirely different second half, right? Where the defense is not because I, I do think that Indiana's defense gets worse as the game goes on because they get tired. Indy, mm-hmm. I've I've been convinced all season that Indiana's defense is actually pretty good. It's better than we thought it was going to be in the preseason. There, they mm-hmm. have some players now on that side hurt. of the ball. They've, they've been hurt. Some, they've been hurt. They they've have got some injuries in the back half that's that's hurt them. Yes, absolutely, that's true. But they're not being put in a good position by the offense. And in this case, as you said, the special teams, right? Like they, there's there's they are on the field a lot. They didn't. Indiana didn't have the ball from the last four minutes in the first half right. to until eight minutes in the second half. And Tom Allen said that you can't play winning football like that. You talk about the middle eight, right? Mm-hmm. Rutgers dominated the middle eight. 
the the four minutes before and after halftime. And so it was just it was too much to overcome. Right. Mm-hmm. Like Indiana Rutgers is not a great team, but they're a solid team. And if Indiana is going to beat a team of that caliber, they're going to need to play a good, solid football game. And they did. not And and like you said, I, I think you're absolutely right that kind of the backbreaker after those special teams miscues was Rutgers going down and scoring and just kind of running the ball straight through Indiana. I think that was the biggest problem was that they were able to run the ball down Indiana's throat mm-hmm. when it seemed Indiana knew the run was coming. And that's the biggest issue, even beyond the special teams errors. But it was an even game. Beyond that, it was a very, very even game that could have been a one-score game down to the end. And they they let it get away from them because of the big plays on special teams. And then also the big play in the in the second half with the big run from the quarterback. Yeah, and this goes this goes to one thing that I pointed out on my Monday show was this. You know, IU goes out the first series of the game and they have their own drive where they convert on a fourth down and eight. Uh, Soresby hits the touchdown. Yeah. Um, Terrific Rutgers, play, by yeah, the way. Well, he scrambled. Rutgers he got scrambled. their eyes in the backfield and they lost, you know, lost sight of the wide receiver standing in the yeah. end zone and he hit him. Rutgers in- immediately comes out and runs their own 75 yard drive, yeah. 15 plays, and ties it back up. Now, that's their first play and first drive of the first half. And then they come out in the second half, do the same thing yeah. where, where the, the, the tide was switched and IU was not able to answer that score and really struggled from that point forward. And this is what I was getting at. You, the difference between Rutgers and Indiana right now is all mental toughness. Rutgers has the mental toughness to overcome uh, what may or may not occur on the field. Indiana's mental toughness is so fragile right now. When something bad happens, their body language, their heads hang. They do. They they're they are expecting the worst to happen, and they're not focused on what they need to do to overcome it. And it's just a cascade of of negativity. And I really think that's the major difference between a Rutgers and an Indiana, the mental toughness of being able to overcome some things. Some of that's athleticism. Don't get me wrong, but it's more so about the mental than it is anything physical at this point, because they're so uh, geared to see what happens. And I think part of that is that Rutgers has something on offense, at least that it does, yes. right? It, mm-hmm. it, it, they run the, the hell out of the ball. They, they, they ran for 276 yards at five yards a clip. Kyle Manungai and the quarterback, whose name is escaping me right now, Gavin Winsett. Gavin Winsett. Yep. Yep. Um, th- those two guys, they have kind of a two-man, just they, they, a give and take with the run game. And they believe on that sideline, if the other team scores, they believe that that run game can go get them a score. That's mm-hmm. what they do. That's the identity they have. Indiana – does not have an identity on offense. They don't know what they want to be. They've been talking about when Walt Bell said he was, it was a run first team and all this and all that. And they don't run the ball well enough to be a run first team. They don't pass the ball well enough to be an air raid team. They don't, <laughs> they don't know what they are or what they want to do. And part of that is because they, the quarterbacks have been switched out. And part of it is because they just haven't developed one as the season's gone on. Cause they hadn't, haven't had, haven't had enough success right. to really believe in what they're doing. I think that so that that's where the mental toughness comes from is right. you believe in what you're doing. You believe it because you've seen it work. Mm-hmm. Indiana has not seen anything on offense work consistently all year. And so you're mm-hmm. not going to have that mental toughness in the biggest moments. Right. And, and it, you know, the flip side of that too, is like you said, you know, the defense hasn't either because when they needed to get stops in that game Saturday, they had critical penalties, you know, that cost them. They don't get off the field on fourth and four that adds six more plays to that one drive. And those are things like Tom Allen said, add up when it comes to the number of plays ran in a game that ultimately have an impact on you especially against the physical ball club like Rutgers was. So, I mean, I think that's the one thing that um, I think got lost in the lost in the outcome of that game. There was everything seemed to jump to um, should Indiana fire time Island right now? Uh, you know, all the negatives that surround that, that ball club right now. And it's, it's gotten to the point where some, I think some have lost the ability to step back and truly analyze it and for what it was because while they they got beat soundly 
uh, 31 to 21, I believe it's a 10 point ball game. You can go right back to the, the, the special teams plays that gave them 10 points, which changes the whole complex um, complexity of the game, but you can't change what's happened. You got to move forward in that. Let's look at the Penn state Nittany lions. Wow. This club is really, really good. And it's got a young quarterback. And like I said, the biggest thing with them is they're able to put some great talent around him. And their defense is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's really good. Really good. Manny Diaz, I, you know, people may not know the background about Manny Diaz. You know, here's a guy that's rise through the ranks, was a head coach, really didn't work out for him. But as a defensive coordinator, he is one of those defensive coordinators that is uh, ever evolving and always challenging. He really challenges offense with his play of defense, and it shows 73 yards rushing a game average. Ohio State, he, they held him to under 100 yards rushing. That was yeah. the, that was the stat that really caught me off guard. Was because holding Ohio State to under 100 rushing <laughs> and losing the game in itself, really, it came down to uh, quarterback play to re, to to a certain degree. But yeah. thoughts on overall about Penn State and you know now an IU team having to go on the road to happy valley another nationally televised game which in some respects they really don't need right now but uh give us some thoughts on penn state yeah i i mean their their defense to just start on that side of the ball is absolutely outstanding right i'm i I, it's it don't want to be pessimistic i i find it hard to i I don't know where indiana's points are going to come from in this game i think they're they're going to struggle to score now penn state's defensive front is very very good maybe the best in the country abdul carter their their uh linebacker defensive end is outstanding and indiana needs to kind of make sure that they would love to have josh henderson back for this game to kind of kind of leave him in the backfield and chip on some of these plays because boy he can really get after the quarterback so can chop robinson the defensive lineman so that's something that's going to be can indiana give Sorsby any time at all to throw right. and so that, that's going to be a huge piece of this game the offensive side I think Indiana has a little bit of a chance to do some work here. Um, Penn State's offense is they want to be a team that runs the ball down your throat. They have the running backs they believe to do that with Nick Singleton and Katron Allen, who were both yeah. terrific as true freshmen last year. Right. They've not been as good as sophomores this year. And I don't think that's the running back's fault. I think it's Penn State has had real trouble over the years and continues to have real trouble moving the pile on the offensive line in run blocking. They just don't get that great of push up front. Um, They're averaging only 4.3 yards per carry. Mm -hmm. They don't push the ball to Indiana's defense this year. When they've given up, when they've given up touchdowns, a lot of times against Rutgers, this wasn't the case really, but when Indiana's defense gives up touchdowns, it's often big plays, right? They, they teams are pushing the ball down the field. Yeah. Yeah, They get the chance. Penn state doesn't do explosive plays. That's just not, that's not what they do. They haven't done it all year even against lesser competition, right? They barely did it against UMass two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can Indiana hold up defensively on the front? Because Penn State is going to try to run four yards. They're going to try to do what Rutgers did. Oh, yeah. Four yards in a cloud of dust and just grind their way down the field over and over and over again. Is Indiana's defense going to be better at stopping that than it was last week? Because they don't have... What Penn State doesn't have is the threat of the quarterback run. I don't think Aller is a statue back there, but he is not the runner that wins it is by any stretch of the imagination. No. So can Indiana bow up on defense? Can those Tom Allen said the linebackers didn't play well against Rutgers? I think that was fairly clear. Mm-hmm. I think can they can they turn in a better performance against Penn State and make this kind of a low scoring slugfest that Penn State is nervous about? Can they can they do that? I think that's going to be the biggest kind of question mark about this game is if Indiana can stay in the game, it's going to be because their defense is playing great in the front seven. Yeah. A couple things here. Drew Allers averaging uh, about 206 yards passing a game, which is very, very uh, realistic uh, amount of yards for a young, a young player, sure. 63%, no interceptions though. He hasn't, no thrown, the, no. both, hasn't thrown any interceptions. And then uh, Singleton and Allen, both are averaging almost 60 yards a game rushing. So, you know, they're getting it done by the one, two punch as opposed to one guy that's really doing it. Now, statistic wise, 
it's this way looking back at this overall i think iu at at, at happy valley has not won in their total series with Penn State. Penn State holds a 12 and 0 record at home yeah. against IU and I think overall it's 24 um, and 2. 24 and 2. So yeah. almost Michigan-esque type of record records against Indiana. So they do have a lot to overcome in that regard. Um, I never bring up Penn state, especially around my son, because that was the game he, he played well in and blew out his knee and cost him his career at Penn state. Uh, so I, I tend not to bring up the Penn state game around him too much because it just kind of <laughs> brings back uh, flashbacks to his time in happy Valley. But um Wide receiver wise, you know, this Keandre Lambert kid, you know, he is a, a special wide receiver. They do a good job of targeting him. Now, Ohio State did a great job uh, of really kind of limiting him on Saturday. And that was the key thing. And there's the, the thing that I think IU has to do a better job of is not letting somebody like Lambert hurt them and get the explosive plays. Yeah. Um, and then on the flip side of that, how does Indiana get explosive plays against this Penn state defense? I mean, that's the one thing that um, I think concerns me the most in, in probably most people. And I know I use offense is probably concerned because <laughs> even when I coached against great teams, um, some in the big 10. So, and I think some things that you say there, they've, I use got to make this a boring game. Yep. Yep. It's almost if if you if you remember the old basketball days when the basketball teams put in the four corner offense and all they did was, you know, drew out the defense and just kind of moved the ball around and ate the clock. And, you know, if they could get trying to get the easy layup type of deal, Indiana has to do some of the same things. They really have to milk the clock. And to do that now, they can't they got to keep it within striking distance, of course. Right. And they have to get first downs, right? You have to be able to move the chains a little bit. And I, I do think they're going to have to hit one or two explosive plays. I, I question whether they can really sustain drives against this defense. I I think they're going to have to air it out. They, they seemed hesitant to really let Soares be cut it loose mm -hmm. against uh, against Rutgers. And yeah. I, I, basically, he had that that long pass uh, to for the touchdown in the opening mm -hmm. drive, and that was more of a broken play. It wasn't supposed to be a long pass. That wasn't what was called. Um, and I think they're going to have to throw the ball down the field. And that, that's the one thing that I think we're – Taven Jackson is a great downfield passer. He, he throws mm -hmm. a very good ball, a catchable ball. He's accurate down the field. I don't think we've seen that from Soresby yet. That's the one thing we're missing in his arsenal is really being able to push the ball down the field. The, the one against Rutgers, the guy was so open, it wasn't really a very difficult throw. Mm -hmm. I, I do think Indiana is going to have to push the ball down. Like, and now, again, that's easier said than done against Penn State, which has one of the best corners in the country in Kalen King. Yeah. Um, but if they're going to win this game and not just keep it close like they did against Ohio State for a while and hang around and then get, kind of get ground to the ground, if they're going to win this game, they're going to have to hit some, some over the top, I think. And I, I, oh, I yeah. don't know whether this team is capable of that, mm -hmm. but that they need to at least give him a little bit of uh, opportunity to, to cut it loose. Now the offensive line has to give him time to throw, and that's going to be a difficult task against this front. But that's going to have to be the the, the, the it's got to be control the clock and hit a couple explosives. I think. Yeah, and the other thing I think that they've got to get more of is they've got to get more in the quarterback run design run game with Sorsby because that to me is where he's going to benefit and help the running game, and you really haven't just seen some of that way and i know rod carey is not about changing too much but i don't think that's something that's overly complicated to add into what they do um and i think soresby has to be that running back quote got type of guy that keeps the defense honest but that's my opinion on it but uh if i was running the show down there he would be a guy that i would utilize in the run game because he's a yeah. big strong kid um last last topic here let's talk um Tom Allen. Um, and I've always qualified this when I've discussed Tom Allen. I know Tom Allen. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Tom Allen as, as a coach, as a person, you're not going to beat a better man, uh, in the game of college football than Tom Allen. Um, but, um, 
as I know, and he knows this is a business and you're graded upon what you do on Saturday afternoons. Here's the facts. He's two and 20 in the big 10. And that's not good enough. I mean, that's just not good enough. So you got to analyze more than just the coaching here. I think it has to do a little bit with what they're recruiting and developing in their program because they're just, they're not doing enough and maybe they're losing too many guys and the portal can't be the answer because there's kids in the portal and they're mostly there for one reason. Um, but here's what I said, and you see, and I'm going to get your take on this. He has a $20 million buyout. If a change is warranted, you can't use the $20 million as an excuse to not make the change. Um, including the assistant coaches who all have at least another year on their contract. So that adds about another 1.5 to 2 million in total buyout with them. But if, if you feel it's warranted and you have to do the right thing for the program, do you believe that you can't make the 20 million, the excuse as to why, because that's why everybody in the news media has said why Tom Allen's not going to get, let go is because of the buyout. I it, it, so I think you're right. You can't make it an excuse. You can't. It doesn't mean that IU won't. Right. And I do, so I have said all along that I do think that barring a late season turnaround, which is not out of the question, they're after yeah, they Penn State. Win. They have. We'll talk they, about that in a right, second. Right. They have Illinois. They have Michigan State. They have Purdue. Those are winnable games, right? Um, and if you end up getting to five and seven. Fine. He, he, he gets another year easy. That's progress from last season. I think that's fine. The question becomes if this thing really breaks bad and they end up two and 10 or three and nine. I think that that would, that would be it for Tom Allen. In my opinion, I think that if I were, if I were waving a magic wand, I would say that it would be time for him to go. Mm -hmm. I do not think they will fire him. Mm -hmm. I think that they will, they will use the twenty million dollars is an excuse. That is not me reporting anything. That is not me having any inside knowledge. That's just kind of the way I feel that I use athletic department feels about football. Is that they're not going to pay twenty million dollars to to get rid of a football coach? They're just I I don't think that will happen. Even if it is warranted, I don't I think it should happen. I don't think it will. That mm -hmm. would be my my answer. I think you're right that it that you can't use it as an excuse if it's what's best for the program. But I think that they probably will end up using it as an excuse. Quite yeah, and, and and here let me say this, and I want to qualify this. I'm not advocating uh, one way or the other on what the status of Tom Allen is. Sure. Um, I don't think being in that position as a coach, um, and 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 getting fired after a 500 season when I was at Ball State and uh, new AD came in and Bubba Cunningham, who's now the AD at at uh north carolina uh and a new president uh unfortunately we got let go and, you know and i still know the day and time that i was notified <laughs> that tells you how much it now i didn't get a big buyout you know when, sure. <laughs> so let me let me preference that don't worry about head coaches and buyouts because they get fired they're gonna live a pretty comfortable life you yeah. know just ask ed ordron right now about sure. his uh, about how he's enjoying life and the bat buyout he got from LSU. But um, the fact of the matter is, is like I said, they're two and 20 over the last few years in big 10 games. That right there, not necessarily is a coaching thing to me. That's a player thing as well. And you've got to look at what is happening within the program in development in the weight room with uh, Wellman and his staff um, because I'm not sure they're getting what they need there on top of, are they getting the right talent in to Indiana? And I'm talking just from recruiting freshmen, you know, kids and stuff and bringing them up through the program because Tom Allen and on more, and, and let me say it this way. He's been there long enough. Now, he should be playing with some juniors and seniors in consistent spaces on his football team. And the reality of it is he really isn't. I mean, in key positions, they're playing red fr freshmen at quarterback. They're playing, you know, offensive linemen that have had one, one year or not even one full year of starting in the big 10. You got guys in the secondary that 
you know, so it's it's one of those head scratchers to me that you you know the development wise is is uh, lacking a little bit. What's your thoughts on you know talent? You've watched them play, you've seen them in person, you get a better different feel from that. Kind of what's your feelings on all of that as well? Yeah, it, it partly this all goes back to I think 2021 was kind of where this started with the issues in personnel. They suffered so many injuries that mm-hmm. year, and then some guys left in the portal after that season. And I think what Tom Allen's it, the, the solution was that after that year, you a lot of it you wanted to just flush and kind of turn things over. And so he went and he went and got a lot of guys from the transfer portal that off season, and some of them hit. There are some good players that he mm-hmm. got from the transfer portal and now and now he's got he did the exact same thing last offseason there are good players on this team that he got from the transfer portal the problem is that when you portal heavy like that like that like they did and i'm not saying it's wrong but what what happens is you don't have the development of guys coming up right right and so their high school recruiting was very good in 2019 and 2020 was very good historically good by indiana standards it has not been as good the last couple of years um, and part of that is because Indiana hasn't been as good on the field. So you're not going to get the level of recruit. Um, but so, so they now, now they have some guys, as you said, it's a combination out there of a lot of transfers and then a lot of young guys. And I do mm-hmm. think there are some talented young guys in, I think obviously Jalen Lucas is the big one. He was oh, a yeah. great find for them. Terrific. But like guys like Philip Dunn, right? Good, really good pickup in the, on the recruiting trail. Lewis Moore, same thing guys mm-hmm. in the second. I think they could be good. But it's a question of how long is that going to take? Is that going to take another year or two for right. them to really figure things out? Um, and, and this offense, a lot of it is built to win now. They have a lot of vets on that offense. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so it, it, it's a question of what, is the roster ever going to get back to where it was, where you had quality across the board? It, it, it's hard for me to see a path to that at this point because high school recruiting right now for them is just not particularly good. It's not where it was in 2019 and 20. And it's hard to, for me to see a path of them getting back to that. Yeah. And some of that, you know, don't forget, you know, when DeBoer came in there and they had Penix and things of that nature, that was the means of the transition between the Kevin Wilson era and the Tom Allen era, where that year that they had a lot of productivity and, you know, the COVID year as well, mostly, um, the, a lot of those guys on the field at that time were kind of Kevin Wilson leftovers to a degree. Sure. And um, then it all transitions to a lot. Now, these are Tom Allen's guys in full force. And that's my thing about the recruiting component is looking at some of the kids that they're bringing in recruiting against and who they're getting. And, you know, that plays a big aspect of it. All right. Last question here. Okay. You're going to put the crystal ball to work. Then I'm gonna let you sure. go. Cause I enjoy talking to you and getting your feel on stuff. Cause you're very good at what you do. Well, thank you. Let's talk bowl eligibility. Sure. People are saying like bowl eligibility. It's like, you know, I, Alan Iverson practice. We're talking about practice. <laughs> We're going to talk about bowl eligibility here. Playoffs. I just hope we can win a game. <laughs> <laughs> the, the moral of the story in this regard, and you alluded to it a little bit earlier, the fact of the matter is the season isn't over for, for IU, even if they they get trounced Saturday against Penn State. Yeah. The reality of it is they have the remainder of the last four games of the season, and some of the toughest games are at home. You got Wisconsin at home, Michigan State's at home. Do they go to Illinois or do they have Illinois at home? I believe they have Illinois at home, but don't quote me on that. So three out of the last four potentially are at home. The only road game is at Purdue. And I don't know if I can, I don't know. I don't have it right in front of me, but I think that's the way it is. Wisconsin, Michigan state and Illinois. I do believe Illinois Illinois is on the road. I apologize. So I thought they had three to three and one, which would have been better. But the reality of going to Illinois is not as bad as going to Penn State and (laughs) Michigan or Ohio State. (laughs) But uh, now Illinois improved. So don't because they had the a game get away from against Wisconsin this past weekend. But the reality of the matter is is that these last games, four games. Uh, with Wisconsin being at home, even though Wisconsin's a good football team, the fact of the matter is, I think they've got 
four games that they can legitimately have a chance of winning. Now, us saying they have a chance at winning doesn't mean we think they're going to win it or anything of that matter. We're looking at it from the standpoint of doom and gloom versus the shade of light. I think you got to look at the shade of light and what lies in front of them as opposed to buyouts and the end of the year uh, coming fastly. But your thoughts on bowl eligibility for the Hoosiers getting to that magic number of six wins. Yeah. I don't think it's out of the question. I, 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 they, they, there are there is a path to them winning those games, right? I, I I do think Michigan State is really rough right now. Um, I think Illinois is improved, as you said. I think that that's absolutely fair. But they they lost by four touchdowns to Purdue two weeks ago, right? Or three yeah. weeks ago, I should say. They beat Maryland and they they almost beat Wisconsin. So they're improved, but they're gettable, right? Mm-hmm. And Wisconsin has has been good this year, but they've also they they've gotten pass happy at times, and there have been issues there with their play calling and all that. So None of these teams is is insurmountable, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the chances of them winning all four, I think, are relatively small, just what we've seen this year, but it's not yeah. out of the realm of possibility. And what I do think is there's a there's a path here for Tom Allen, especially, to finish strong and say, see, we're fi- we figured things out. We have a lot of guys back next year. We're feeling good about where we're at. Mm-hmm. I, there's a path that I think these last four games, and take the Penn State game out of it, that it's going to be what it is. If it, it's going to be clarifying one way or the other, if they go out and win two or three of those four, then you start to say this season wasn't as much of a disaster as we thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. If they only win one or none, then it's like, well, this is everything we thought it was. The doom and gloom was correct. I think it's you're not going to be able to hedge one way or the other at the end of the season. You're going to we're going to find out what this team is made of because these are winnable games. It's, you're not going against Michigan or Ohio State. After Penn State, the schedule should be manageable for a team that is playing hard and is playing competent football. And can Indiana do that? I don't know at this stage. I think they can. It's a question of getting it done. Well, you're exactly right. The probability of it happening right at this point is low. If they would happen to get two in a row, that maybe changes uh, yeah, perspective. It starts to snowball, I think. Yeah, absolutely, right. in a good way. Right, and we'll have to wait and see. But Dylan, I really appreciate you joining me here today. I know I've occupied a lot of your morning time here, and you probably got other things better to do than to talk yeah. to me. But I really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely, Shane. Always glad to do it. Thanks for having me. Dylan Sin from the General Gazette here on the Hoosier Football Tailgate. I want to thank him and his. Uh, ability to join us here today on the Hoosier football tailgate. And I think he had some really good uh, concept of what he thinks it's going to take uh, for Indiana uh, to really get themselves in a position of, of um, you know, getting themselves in a position to get that snowball effect, but against Penn state this week, it's, it's a game that they have to win in an ugly fashion and keep Penn State on their heels. Remember, Bet Online is your number one source for all things sports with basketball, NHL, hockey, college football, NFL. They have all the up to date odds as well as stats and news. Bet Online is where the game starts. And I want to thank Bet Online for their sponsorship of the Hoosier Football Tailgate here on the Believe Network. We'll be back on Monday. We'll have a recap of Penn State. We'll look a little bit ahead to the next game. But for now, I'm the coach, Shannon Griffith. This has been the Hoosier Football Tailgate on the Believe Network.